Godwin's law posits that as an online discussion grows longer, the probability of a comparison to Hitler approaches 100%. It basically means that any online conversation you read, if it goes on for long enough, will eventually lead to Hitler references. Well, in the world of gaming, we've got our own Godwin's law, only it isn't about Hitler, it's about Dark Souls. It's becoming increasingly difficult to find serious video game critique that doesn't, at some point, reference From Software's action RPG masterpiece. It's gotten so bad that people have started to notice. Here you are, this little yellow dude running around in maze, collecting little goblets and being chased by monsters. I mean, this is the Dark Souls of arcade games. But there's a good reason for Dark Souls being used as such a strong point of comparison in so many discussions. And that's because it did a lot of things really well. It wasn't the first to get a third person action RPG combat rhythm right, or crushing difficulty, or interconnected worlds, or opaque storytelling. But it did all of these well at the same time, and the confluence of its competence earned it a great breakthrough status that became a point of reference for the gaming community to use when explaining things. It essentially became part of our language. It was much easier to describe difficulty as Dark Souls hard than it was to say really hard, because your version of really hard might be different from my version of really hard, but we both objectively understand what we mean when we say Dark Souls hard. In response to the constant referencing of Dark Souls, a large portion of the gaming community has grown really frustrated with how often this comparison is used. Not everything needs to be described as Dark Souls. That's incredibly lazy journalism. There are plenty of things that existed before that. We need to be a little more creative in discussing these things. It does feel a touch lazy for it to be referred to so often when explaining ideas or concepts in games. And while some of this criticism is perfectly valid, I think we also need to recognize at this point that Dark Souls isn't just a game. It was the starting point of a genre. Just like Metroid or Castlevania spawned Metroidvania, or Wolfenstein spawned modern day FPS, or Mario sort of spawned 2D and 3D platforming, Dark Souls didn't invent the third person action RPG genre, but it did perfect it and its elements in such a way that something new was born. The Souls-like genre as it came to be known, which spawned many spin-offs including From Software's own Bloodborne, to 2D side-scrollers like Salt and Sanctuary, and The Lords of the Fallen, developed by Deck 13, who also developed the game we're here to talk about today, The Surge. The Souls-like genre is still new, however, and since there aren't a ton of games in that genre, almost every review of The Surge you watch or read will be drenched with comparisons to Dark Souls, not only because The Surge fits within the Souls-like genre, but also because it directly lifts huge parts of the Souls formula and transplants them directly into itself. I've already done a really detailed comparison of how The Surge and Dark Souls are both similar and different, so if you'd like that detail, go and check out that video, which I've left in the description below. For this review, I wanted to try and do the impossible. I want to review The Surge without referencing Dark Souls. I will mention it once or twice as I talk about various things, but I won't be using it as a direct point of comparison to The Surge, because I want to assess this game on its own, as a unique experience, as something part of the burgeoning Souls-like genre, but distinct from the game that inspires it. This approach will, I hope, free us of a lot of the bias about what is a good Souls game and what it should be, while also hopefully making the review a lot more accessible to those that haven't played Dark Souls before. So, the gauntlet has been laid down. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you my review of The Surge. I got my start on YouTube by covering Tom Clancy's The Division, a tactical third-person MMO-like shooter very similar in many regards to Destiny. 
One of the biggest things that people love and hate about that game is the setting. So many people love The Division for its realistic, boots on the ground setting. There's a degree of future tech mixed in there, but it's pretty minor, and overall the visual and storytelling motif is fairly consistent and realistic. There's a beautifully rendered, hyper-realistic portrayal of New York City in there to wander around in, and in many regards the city is the star of the show with just how detailed and immersive it is. But while many love The Division's setting, many loathe it for its obvious impact on gameplay design. See, in Destiny, you can build literally anything you want. There are no restrictions other than your own imagination when it comes to settings and weapons and armor and story and space magic and whatever, you name it. And this is the case for any game that chooses to stand outside the realistic setting. The possibilities are endless. But the closer you come to realism, the more limited you become in your gameplay or visual design choices. A lot of people find that The Division is really boring because of how homogenized so much of it has to be. Your weapons and armor will all sort of look the same, the areas you fight in kind of look the same, the enemies you square off against all look and feel kind of the same, and the huge amounts of HP they have feels really off. Having to unload two magazines of ammo into an enemy's head might make sense from an RPG perspective, but it feels decidedly off from a gameplay perspective. I bring this example up because the main value proposition for The Surge is really how it plans to take the Souls-like genre into the sci-fi setting. It was the main hook for me when I first saw the trailer for the game some years back. I wanted the Souls-like action and difficulty I'd come to love, but I wanted it in the sci-fi setting that I frankly enjoy more than you know, Dungeons and Dragons and the like. I was totally on board with this idea, and I think that most people who were interested in this game and who have been following it during its development are probably interested in the same thing. And I must say that I think Deck 13 have done an absolutely superb job on delivering on the core concept of this setting. It's clear that they stuck a few visual design pillars on their wall and built the entire game around those things. An industrial complex with its security apparatus, technological plumbing and steel facades, armor that looks like it belongs in a factory setting or in a decontamination area, or on a high-tech security guard, enemies that clearly belong to the places that you're moving through, be they highly armored humans, robotic attack dogs, flying drones, or even zombie-like enemies corrupted by the manufactured chemicals. All of this feels like it belongs. It's one of the most visually congruent games I have ever played. But that statement is both praise and criticism. I spent about 35 hours playing through the Surge, and in that time I encountered a total of about 12 enemies. I visited seven areas, and for the life of me, I could not tell one from the other. All of them felt almost identical. I unlocked dozens of shortcuts connecting the highly interconnected world, but more often than not, these shortcuts all looked and functioned exactly the same. Be they a security door, or a ventilation shaft, or a lift, or whatever, there was really only about three of them, and they were used again and again. I fought a total of five bosses, and three of those bosses were very similar in function and form. A lot of previews for this game have described it as science fiction, and I thought that as well, but having played through it now, I think it's far more accurate to call the setting industrial. It feels much more like Fallout than it does Mass Effect, and that's because the industrial setting we see here clings to much of what is real, or perhaps possible, rather than freeing itself of earthly bounds and drawing from the limitless well of sci-fi possibility. I think though that The Surge pays a huge, huge price for the way it has implemented its excellent setting. I've seen industrial settings in games pushed into some really unexpected and interesting territories. Things like Fallout or Borderlands or Rage or any other number of titles. Games that have taken a setting but still pushed out from the center in really interesting ways. Here you get the feeling that The Surge is more constrained by its setting rather than enabled by it. And I think that for an action RPG Souls-like game that asks you to revisit the same environment so many times and kill so many of the same enemy, diversity of setting and enemies and mechanics is really important. And it's just lacking here. You've well and truly seen most of what the setting and enemies have to offer by about the first 10 to 15 hours of play. 
and it doesn't help that the story you move through during the game is definitely on the forgettable side. It does have NPCs, a voiced main character, scripted scenes that are cutscene-like, plenty of audio logs and NPC side quests to complete or flesh out the open world, but I think it's highly unlikely that you'll ever see YouTube channels springing up to cover the ins and outs of NPC motivations or the history of Creo, the company at the center of the Surge's story. There's a story in the Surge, but I'd be very surprised if anyone really loves it. This is a mechanically driven game about the experience of progressing through the world. It's not a story driven game. So be sure to set your expectations accordingly when you step into the experience. Overall, I will say this though. The core of the setting of The Surge is excellent. I really love it. And I love the way that Deck 13 have built that core and embedded it across the game. I just wish, and I'm sure many people will agree with me when they experience it for themselves, that Deck 13 were willing to do more with it. I'll say this a few more times throughout this review, but I desperately hope that there is a sequel for this game. And if there is, I hope that the developers build on this excellent setting rather than throw it away and start fresh or abandon the consistency of their approach in the name of totally disconnected diversity that strays too far away from the core premise. I think there's a way to deliver a better variety of enemies and settings without giving up on that core industrial context that Deck 13 have done such a good job developing. And I really hope that Deck 13 are able to find this middle ground in the future. As you may or may not know, this is not Deck 13's first Souls-like rodeo. The first game they released in this genre was Lords of the Fallen, a game that quite a few people played because it was actually offered for free as part of the PS Plus and Games with Gold program last year. The problem with Lords of the Fallen was that it wasn't particularly great. It copied almost everything from Dark Souls, including its setting, and where it tried to ideate away from Dark Souls, it failed. Its combat felt overly clunky, moving your character felt like getting a freight train moving, and there was a considerable delay between when you pressed the attack button and when it actually occurred. Most people just didn't like it, and it's clear that the developer didn't like it either, because they not only threw away that IP, they listened to their fans and delivered what anyone would want if they're a fan of the third-person action RPG genre. Excellent combat and excellent RPG mechanics baked right into that core combat loop. You guys remember this movie, right? Elysium? Matt Damon spends most of the movie being pretty useless until he finally straps on his big rig body armor and then he goes around kicking ass all the way until the credits roll. Well, Deck 13 seemed to have liked that idea a lot and it used it as the core premise for their combat design. You play as Warren, a wheelchair-bound man who takes a job at Creo, the sort of shady conglomerate whose slick PR voice foreshadows nefarious intent. Upon arrival, your rig is bolted into you in a very unhygienic fashion and you wait with your rig around you enabling you to walk and also bolt additional pieces of armor and weapons to it. It's from here that the combat begins and it feels really really glorious. Your player speed is pitch perfect, the controls are snappy and responsive, the dodge animation is awesome and the weapon swing animations are spot on. There's also a variety of weapons available in the surge from one hand pipes to huge great hammer style mallets, to dual fist style weapons. There's just heaps and heaps of stuff to choose from. You can totally determine your play style and what's gonna work best for you. I wanna be really clear about this overall point because I know a lot of people are cautious about Deck 13's approach to combat given the clunkiness of Lords of the Fallen. That is not a thing here in this game. Here, the combat feels excellent, and the soundness of that feeling is only the start of how good that combat experience is. Many, many years ago, there was a title from Squaresoft, back when they were still Squaresoft. It was called Vagrant Story. Now, right now, there's a whole bunch of people clicking the like button on this video, because Vagrant Story was one of those games that was so loved and so cherished by the very few people that played it, 
that it achieved almost mythic status. It's constantly referenced as one of the greatest RPGs ever made, and also on those lists of best games you've never played. Vagrant Story was a tactical JRPG set in a medieval castle with a truly brilliant combat system, allowing you to target individual enemy body parts to do bonus damage or to disable certain types of attacks or whatever. Great system that for some reason very few games went on to emulate. Well, The Surge incorporates this body damage model as well, and it absolutely nails it. Each enemy has legs, a body, arms, and a head, and you can individually target each of them. Your attack animations change based on which body part you're targeting, and also where you're at in your combo and your position. It's just a really well-constructed animation system that keeps combat flowing and feeling really realistic no matter where you're aiming for. And aiming for different body parts is key because aiming Aiming for unarmored body parts will deal bonus damage, allowing you to kill that enemy fast, while aiming for armored body parts allows you to eventually hack off that body part in an execution animation and claim that weapon or armor piece for yourself. So where other games give you a random chance to get some totally not relevant drop after killing an enemy, The Surge allows you to choose what item you want from an enemy, and the way you get it is by literally cutting it off your foes. It is awesome. And it's also intelligent from a game design perspective, because it asks the player to decide between killing enemies quickly and more easily, versus taking longer but getting crafting materials and drops that you can use to make other drops and other stuff. I just love this amputation system so much. I love the combat so damn much. I've finished the game now, and though I'm seriously time poor, I'm considering starting a new game plus, because it just feels so good and so fun to fight in this game. This, in my view, is the Surge's biggest achievement, and given how far Deck 13 have come from Lords of the Fallen, it is a huge, huge achievement at that. But there's a reason why I feel like I haven't had my combat thirst fully quenched, and that's because the great irony of the Surge is that it provides the player with one of the best combat systems in any third-person action game ever, while simultaneously making combat so unbelievably challenging that you spend way more time running past enemies than you do fighting them. It's time to talk about the Surge's biggest weakness in counter design. I used to do hardcore progression raiding in World of Warcraft for, yeah, like 10 years. I played way too much WoW, and uh, by far away, the worst memories that I have were clearing trash mobs towards bosses. Trash mobs is an RPG term referring to any enemy that isn't a boss. So a Goomba in Mario is a trash mob, where Bowser is the boss. Simple. Well, in WoW, the raid dungeons you clear through typically had anywhere from 1 to 13 bosses, and in most of them there was a mountain of trash to clear before those bosses. And it was boring because you got nothing out of it for doing it, generally, and because there was just so damn much of it. And some of it was the worst. Some of it was harder than the bosses themselves, and you got nothing out of it. It felt really crap, and while it's less of a thing these days, it was one of the core parts of the WoW experience in days gone past. Trash mobs in most other games are generally fine. As players, we understand that games can't be built around boss encounters, with the exception of something like Shadow of the Colossus or Fury. Trash mobs provide the player with a chance to fight in a more risk-free, low-stakes, short-term reward framework. Engage an enemy, try out some fancy combos, kill them fast, get some loot, get some XP, and move one step closer to the boss. This works because it provides a regular combat rhythm that keeps us regularly engaging in the combat system as we play the game. The Souls-like genre takes this idea and ramps up the difficulty on that trash. Most trash enemies can kill you fairly quickly if you aren't careful, but most of the time you can also kill them fairly quickly as well. There's a good mix of really hard, really high-risk trash enemies with easier, low-risk trash enemies. And the intent here is, again, to give the player something to fight regularly as they progress through the different environments. You want to invite the player to fight enemies, and part of that equation is easing off on the difficulty quantum in the name of inviting the player to take the risk to fight the enemy, right? It's a delicate balancing act. The Surge goes a very, very different way here. 
It does away with almost all of the easy to kill, low risk trash enemies that pull the player into those regular combat rhythms and instead replaces them with high HP, high risk enemies everywhere with increasingly complex movesets that deal more and more damage the further into the game you get. So everywhere you go in the surge, you'll meet one of about 12 different enemy types, and each one of them has a pretty good chance of kicking your ass if you aren't careful, and each of them takes a pretty considerable amount of effort to bring down in most situations. And it must be said that each of these enemies is actually really well designed. Good, clear movesets with clear telegraphs and predictable animations. As far as enemy design goes, the Surge doesn't push any boundaries, but it does what it needs to do and it does it well. It's developed a good suite of functional, fair, but crushingly difficult enemies to go up against. Some people are really going to love this. They're going to celebrate the difficulty dial being turned up on the trash mobs, and they'll love the challenge that comes from the task of getting from point A to point B. There's no room for carelessness in this formula, and that's going to appeal to the sort of player that sort of sadomasochistically chases those sorts of challenges. But there's a flip side to this, and that's that having the difficulty dial turned up in the way that it has been will most likely force the player to abandon combat altogether in the name of progression. See, as you go through the surge, you'll very quickly realize that fighting enemies just isn't worth it. They can kick your ass in too many ways, either through their complex animations or their high HP or their huge amounts of damage that they deal. And as such, what you'll find yourself doing more often than not is just running past all of them and trying to get to the switch you need to click so that you can progress through to the next area. This is a pattern of play that begins to emerge toward the middle of the game as difficulty ramps up, but it gets completely out of control in the final section of the game, where the sheer number of enemies in close proximity to one another make the sort of running style gameplay almost compulsory and it's almost like the developers realize that it's over the top because switches the ones that you need to get to in order to progress to the next area when I click them they actually make me immune when I reach them and when I do the clicking animation if the developers were really committed to the idea of having to clear all the trash mobs to progress from one area to the next they wouldn't let me do this but they do and that's why I suspect that even Deck 13 themselves know that they've gone a little bit too far here. They let the player off the hook a little bit because they can see that the framework they've built just isn't functional and it really isn't conducive to a well-paced experience. And that's really the crux of it. The Surge has a huge problem with pacing. The open areas are strong and build the combat flow really well, but the enemy difficulty scaling begins to seriously undermine the experience. I really enjoyed the first five sections of The Surge because it was kind of holding on to that balance of fight versus flight. But in the last two sections, things get completely out of control and the experience becomes thoroughly unenjoyable. Even with maxed out tank gear and stacking full stamina, I can still be two shot by an average trash mob. And I deal so little damage to enemies that it just isn't worth trying. I ran past almost everything in those last two sections of the game, meaning I was missing out on the glorious combat loop that the developers have built for us. The same pacing also applies to the bosses in the game. Now, if you're someone that doesn't want the bosses spoiled for them, please skip ahead to the time I've got on the screen now, because I know a lot of people play these games for bosses and I don't want you to spoil them. That is your spoiler warning. I'm now going on. All right, so bosses. There are five of them. The first two are actually very sound in terms of mechanics in that they took me a good amount of time to learn and perfect, but they were fairly dull. They were just giant robots like any other number of giant robots. The third boss is the exact opposite of this. It looks awesome. It's this giant machine thing. It was so unique and interesting and cool. I was just like, it looked amazing, right? But mechanically, it was extremely simple and I was able to take it down on just my second attempt. It required almost no learning whatsoever. The fourth boss is a nightmare. A hard hitting NPC that can two shot you, but goes away and regens his health every 25% or so. And when he's regenerating, I need to fight the first boss of the game again, literally the first boss, they just reuse it. Only I need to do it three times. This encounter ends up taking like 10 to 15 minutes and most of it was doing a fight I had already done before. Only now I need to do it perfectly three times in a row or I start again from the beginning. 
And the final boss is a two-stage fight filled with unexpected animations that don't telegraph properly, so I'm constantly getting one shot with almost no way of avoiding it. Followed in the second phase by this ludicrously easy NPC that's easier than most of the trash mobs in the game. It's an uneven approach to difficulty, demanding long form perfection in some areas and asking only basic capability in the others. But more than that, the bosses just aren't that great and they don't serve as the memorable checkpoints that they should owing to both their design and their theme. I'm all for difficulty. In fact, I love difficulty. I'm a huge fan of soul style games because they are hard. But what I didn't realize until playing The Surge is that I need a mix of really hard enemies and sort of hard enemies to keep me engaged in combat. And I need well made bosses to make clearing all of that really hard trash worthwhile. The Surge's key conceit is that the environment and its trash enemies are more the focus of the game than the bosses themselves, but it has tipped the scales so far away from the player that the player is more incentivized to just run past both the enemies and the environments they populate. It's a shame because the Surge's combat is some of the best I've ever played and I really wish I could have a chance to fairly participate in more of it. As I look back on The Surge in its entirety, I'm actually left feeling not disappointed, but rather optimistic. The Surge is a game that, I think, has made meaningful contributions to the Souls-like genre. I think its combat is excellent, and in particular its body targeting system is extremely intelligent and highly functional. I think its industrial setting is brilliant, and the third boss design is the perfect example of how to use this theme in a really interesting way. I see the core of a really strong, really capable Souls-like franchise here, but it isn't there yet. The story does not engage and there just isn't enough creative license taken with the industrial setting to set one area apart from the other. Crucially, the difficulty framework is just reaching for challenge in all the wrong places and forces the player into negative play patterns without rewarding them with memorable, well-constructed boss battles to punctuate the adventure. The result is a game that I enjoyed as a Souls-like fan and as a fan of the setting, but not one that I can honestly recommend to a lot of players, especially those that are new to the Souls genre. I think that this just isn't showing the best that the genre has to offer. But I really believe that it could in future. As I said earlier, I really, really hope that there is a sequel to this game someday. It would be a day one purchase for me because we've seen from Deck 13 that they are willing to listen and respond to player feedback based on how far they've come since Lords of the Fallen. And the fundamentals of this game, the surge, are just so worth sticking with. It's like Terminator. The first one was good, but not great, but Jim Cameron stuck with the license because the bones were really good. He could sense that. And he ended up going on to make what would be regarded as the greatest action movie ever made. I think Deck 13 have a future hit on their hands here, but we're not quite there yet.